Take your Bibles and join me in the book of Ezra. Ezra, chapter number five tonight. Ezra, chapter number five. I have so enjoyed uh, this study. By the time I, uh, I don't know if you can tell or not, but by the time I get to the pulpit on Wednesday night, I just can't hardly wait to share with you some of the things that the Lord has taught me. And uh, tonight, I'd I'd like to uh, speak to you this evening on resume the work resume the work. Ezra, really chapter number four, it begins, and in Ezra chapter number five, uh, we find um, the work coming to a conclusion, and then we discover how God stirred up the people to resume the work. And so I want you to look with me, if you would. Uh, You may remember two weeks ago, last Wednesday we were out of town, but two weeks ago we were talking about the adversaries and how they had risen up and how they uh, had uh, made life difficult for those who were rebuilding the temple. And uh, notice the end result. We're going to skip down to the end of the chapter, but here is the end result of the work of these adversaries against the people of God who were rebuilding the temple. Verse number 24, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased under the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So we know that that the work ceased, and as we read this, we also understand that it ceases for a period of years, because he's he's saying that it ceased until the second year of the reign of this man by the name of Darius. Um, And and I, I, through some studying, I've discovered that the work actually ceased for a total of 10 years, in which the, uh, the work of the house of God that was supposed to be rebuilt sat completely empty, and nothing happened, no Further progress was made. Now, notice chapter 5, verse number 1. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Jerusalem and Judah, in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Notice verse number 2. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua the son of Jozadak, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. Uh, obviously, we've talked about these adversaries that, uh, that came upon the work that God had called his people to do there in Ezra chapter number four. And as we discover, according to Ezra four and verse number 24, the adversaries were successful. And because of their, uh, because of their uh, adversarial ways, the work of rebuilding the temple of God ceased for 10 whole years. Now, now think about all of the miracles that uh, God had done to bring them to this point prior to the work ceasing. Uh, God had overturned 70 years of Babylonian captivity. He had stirred in the heart of a pagan king. Uh, to, to send the people back and to, and to tell them to rebuild the temple. God had done all of these things. He even went so far as to see to it that the sacred vessels that had been stolen during the initial raid on the city of Jerusalem 70 years prior, he, he took those sacred vessels and he gave them back to the people of God who were returning to rebuild the house of God. I mean, that's a miracle in of itself. That here's a political leader giving away some of his uh, political wealth and prosperity, giving these sacred vessels. God had done all of these things. Uh, he had uh, the the people had responded to God's stirring by returning and by beginning the work uh, of rebuilding the altar and uh, resuming the offering of animal sacrifices, and and ultimately the people had responded by even laying the foundation uh, for the temple. We learn about all of that in Ezra's chapter number one through chapter number three. And I just have to tell you that the first three chapters, uh, if you are a spiritual man or a spiritual woman, the first three chapters of the book of Ezra uh, are are really a dream in many respects. Uh, A dream of God and his people working together to accomplish great and historic things. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, when, you, when you read this, knowing the nature of this world and knowing the nature of people to see all of this progress being made and all of these things happening really uh, is an incredible thing. However, however, the adversary was sure, was sure to see to it that the work not continue. And that's, the, that's the lesson that we learned from chapter number four. Uh, after four years of building together, the adversaries rose up And the work that had been going on there on the Temple Mount, it ground to a complete halt. 
And the people returned to their new homes there in Jerusalem and in Judah, and uh, the construction site that at one time was buzzing with activity now is going to sit silent for 10 whole years. Now, you know as well as I do that the longer of a break we take from whatever it is we are engaged in, whatever it is we are working on, the harder it is to resume that work. Uh, I... um, I think to myself of, you know, days in which maybe it's a little hot outside and, and maybe I'm, uh, I'm at home and I've got yard work to do and, and uh, I go out there and, and uh, you know, get to the yard work and start mowing the lawn and doing different things. And, and uh, my wife, if it's around lunchtime, she'll stick her head out the door or, you know, she'll wave at me, come on in, it's time to have some lunch. And, uh, and I'm always eager for that. But there's something that happens when I walk into that air-conditioned house. And I sit down to eat a meal, and, and, uh, and you know, what, hap- what always happens after you've eaten a meal? You start to get tired, right? And you start to get a little weary. And I, I have to tell you, there have been days, there have been days in which I have come in from doing my yard work, from whatever it is that I'm doing outside, and there have been days in which I have spent the rest of the day <laughs> in the house, sitting in a lazy boy recliner, watching television, sipping on some, you know, sweet tea or Diet Coke, or, you know, maybe taking a nap or reading a good book, and, uh, and I find the longer I sit in that position, the harder it is to get up from that chair and to put those shoes back on and to go back outside and to resume the work. Now that's, you know, that's an hour or two. Imagine, imagine 10 whole years. You know, you know what happens when something sits empty for 10 years. It falls into a state of disrepair. Uh, things begin to break down. Things begin to uh, wear out, even though they've not been used. And I just have to think, with every subsequent day, with every passing year, it got harder and harder and harder to return to that work and to that job that, that they had really come back to do in the first place. Uh, there's something about human nature. Uh, there is a, a tendency among human beings to make excuses and to be content with the work that has been done done while neglecting to do the work that still remains to be done. And so with the work on the temple ceasing, the people threw themselves into rebuilding uh, their own community and their own lives while ignoring, while ignoring the very work of God, which was the whole reason that God had done all of this stirring in the first place, was to bring them back and to rebuild the temple. And yet here we are, we're 14 years into this return back to the nation of Judah and Jerusalem, and all we have is a foundation, and even that foundation is beginning, no doubt, to wear out and to wear down and to suffer from the neglect. Uh, the, the adversary, here's what I want you to understand. The adversary is okay with progress. The adversary is okay with progress in our own lives just so long as it isn't spiritual progress. Now think about that. The people of God, they're, now, they're, they're back living in the nation of Judah. Uh, they're back living in the city of Jerusalem. It's inhabited again. The foundation has, has been laid, and, uh, and then they walk away from the job, and now they begin to build their own homes, and they begin to build their own communities, and perhaps they begin to build some roads, and, and they put in place maybe some, you know, some, some things that will help them and, and as far as government is concerned. And, 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 and listen, the adversary leaves them alone for 10 whole years. Why? Progress is being made. The key is this. Spiritual progress is not being made. They're not, they're not doing what God has called them to do. Oh, they're living in the land again, but why has God chosen them to live in that land? Uh, that, they, uh, that they glorify him through their worship. And I have to tell you, listen, we as people, we must recognize this, this concept uh, of, of, of the idea that the adversary is okay with us making progress in our career, uh, making progress in our, uh, you know, in our finances, making progress in our physical health and well-being. But what the adversary is going to rise up and he's going to come against you the moment, the moment that you begin to get stirred up about making some level of spiritual progress in your life. He'll leave, he'll leave you alone so long as the progress that you're making is not spiritual. And the moment that you begin to get serious about your walk with God and begin to live your life for the Lord and to, and to serve him in a way that is pleasing to him, at that moment, at that moment, that's when the adversary rises up again. I want you to know the work of God is always advancing. God is always leading 
his people to new heights. Uh, in, in other words, the work of God is never a work that says sit down there for a while and take it easy. Uh, the work of God doesn't, doesn't, does, doesn't work that way. Uh, there's, there's, not a, there's not a period in which we go on vacation in our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey. God is always advancing. He is always leading forward. Uh, our flesh and this world is continually resisting this advancing work. And here's the question I want to try to answer tonight. How does God lead to get his people working again? Perhaps maybe you're here tonight and you can think back uh, to a time in your life in which uh, you were much, much more engaged in God's work than you are tonight. Um, you're still here, but, but, but if you're honest with yourself, you, you'd acknowledge and recognize, you know, there was a time in which I was much more passionate about my Christian life and my Christian journey. And here's the question, how, how, does, how does God work in a life to, to, to get you to resume that work? What, is, what does God do? What, what does God use to get, uh, to, to get you going again, to get you moving again? You know, you're, you're, you're sitting maybe in the, in, the, in the recliner of life, and you, you, you've, gotten, you've gotten away from doing what God has called you to do, and, and instead you're sort of sitting down and you're sort of relaxing, and you know, you know there's work to be done. You know there's a job to do. How in the world, how in the world is God, does God stir you up about that? Well, we see that we see a we see in our in our text some things that I think help us to understand how God works in lives to get people to resume the work. And I want to I want us to consider that together tonight. Number one, I want you to notice that I discover in our text a familiar pattern. I think there's a familiar pattern that is found here in this fifth chapter. It's actually at chapter number five, verses one to seventeen. And uh, and so I want you to notice with me this familiar pattern. Number one. As we consider this familiar pattern, we discover that it begins with powerful preaching. It begins with powerful preaching. Now, would you look with me in verse number one, where the Bible says, Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. I believe, I believe that the, 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 the pattern that God uses oftentimes, more often than not, if God's going to stir up someone and they're going to resume the work that they were once doing, oftentimes it begins with this, this idea of powerful preaching stirring them up. After 10 years, God gives a message to these prophets. Their names are listed for us here, Haggai and Zechariah, and they began to preach and to prophesy the message that God had given them. Can I say the work of God awful, often follows this familiar pattern? And, and can I say that God has primarily chosen preaching to be a key component in this pattern? And, and, and what I want to say is, listen, the Cleveland Baptist Church has a lot of, of good things. <coughs> A lot of wonderful things that we're blessed with as a, uh, as a people. But can I say, a lot of these things we could do without. We, we could do without and the work could still go forward. Uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that um, you know, there's a lot of things that we've gotten used to, that we've gotten comfortable with, that we've gotten familiar with. And we could go forward, really, if we didn't have those things. And the work of God could go forward without those things. But can I say that the work of God cannot go forward without, listen, without someone, without someone that has been called by God who stands and boldly proclaims and teaches God's word. Now, preaching is a key component. In fact, Paul had much to say about the subject of preaching in his epistles. Now, here, here, is, here is what he said. I want to share with you three, three specific thoughts about preaching uh, that, that Paul gives to us. Would you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, please? 1 Corinthians chapter number one. I want you to notice some thoughts that Paul gives uh, about preaching uh, from this text. Would you look with me in verse number 18? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Amen. And here's what, you need to know, here's what you need to know about preaching. Here's what Paul says. Paul says preaching is either foolish or life-giving depending on your spiritual condition. That's what, he, that's what he says very clearly in that text. It is either, it is either foolishness or it is life-giving and life-transforming depending on your spiritual condition. Now, you may be here tonight and you may be wondering, well, what is my spiritual condition? And I would say that a, that a test that you could take is, is this. 
what is my relationship to preaching? Now, now, now I understand, you're, you're here, it's Wednesday night, you're here, you're here. And, and you'd say, well, you know, my relationship with preaching must be pretty good because I'm sitting here on Wednesday night. And we look around the building and, and uh, we can say, you know, it's a whole lot fuller in here on Sunday morning than it is on Wednesday night, right? It's a whole lot fuller in here on Sunday night than it is on, <clears throat> than it is on Wednesday. Now, there's reasons for that. Obviously, all of our children are gone, all of our teenagers are gone, and our singles are gone. And we've got Bible, a Bible doctrines class that's being taught, and we've got you know, the nurseries that are being met, and all of those require staffing. So we've got a lot of people out of the room here tonight. But, but, but maybe, maybe you'd say, well, I'm here tonight, but is it possible that you're here tonight because you know, your, your children are in Sunday school or we could call it Wednesday school, I guess. Your children are in classes and they're being taught, or your teenagers are in classes and they're being taught, and you're sitting here saying, well, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I, I could take it or leave it, but I might as well stick around. I look kind of, kind of bad if I drop the kids off and I go do something else, and so I'll just, I'll sit and I'll grin and bear it for an hour. You, you get the idea, right, that, that, that one of the ways I think that we can determine how we're doing spiritually is what is our, what is our relationship to preaching? Uh, did you know that if, if you're lost, according to what Paul is saying here, if you're a lost person, you're not saved, then preaching is foolishness. It, to you, it's a waste of time, which is why, by and large, lost people don't come to church. Now, every once in a while, they'll pop them. Somebody will maybe guilt trip them into it, or there'll be a special emphasis, and, and uh, please, please come and, and sit in my church. But, and they'll come. They'll humor, you, they'll humor us. They'll come for a Sunday, but, but we won't expect to see them back because they're, they're lost, and they, they view church attendance and sitting in a pew and listening to somebody ramble on for you know, 30, 35 minutes, they view that as a waste of time. I'm busy enough, I don't need to be sitting in church having somebody lecture me about how I'm supposed to be living. So, so to lost people, preaching is foolishness. It's silly, it's a waste of time. I, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, lost people, they sit in a pew and they watch someone who, who's passionate, you know, a passionate preacher, not, you know, not some guy who's, you know, who's stale and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. But they watch a passionate preacher and they'll ask questions like this. Why is that guy yelling like that? What's he yelling about, you know? What's he so mad about? What's he so angry about? Uh, literally, literally, lost people will ask questions like that. Um, why, why is he so passionate? Here, here's a good one. Why is he taking so long? Why is he taking so long? As a young boy, as a young boy, my uh, my mom uh, uh, grew up in a, in a church uh, about two and a half hours from here, and uh, so when whenever, whenever we go visit my grandparents, we go to their church, and uh, this will reveal the the depth of my spiritual uh, of my spiritual condition at this point in time as a young man. I remember her boyhood pastor. He would he would stand in the pulpit and he would say, "In conclusion," and I would be like, "Yes, conclusion." Then he would go for like another 20, 25 minutes. And I mean, it, it didn't take but two or three times for that to happen in which I was on to him, you know. I, I knew, I knew he was not concluding. He still had a ways to go before he brought that thing in for a landing. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, I got that, I understood that. But, but you, you, know, you know lost people, they're sitting here and they're saying, why is he taking so long, you know? And, and maybe, maybe, even, <laughs> maybe even some saved people are sitting here saying, why is he taking so long, you know? And, and uh, does he really have that much to say? On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're saved, preaching is not foolishness. Preaching is powerful. It is life-giving. Saved people that are right with God, that are walking with God. Listen, saved people rearrange their schedule so they can be present when the preacher preaches. And that's, that's, what, that's what saved people do. Now, I'm not, I'm not just up here tooting my own horn because I'm the preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that as you study Scripture and you look at, look at this text, if, if preaching, listen, if the preaching of the cross to them that is saved is the power of God, if the power of God was going to be on display, wouldn't you want to be present for it? If I'm saved and I believe that, the, that, that preaching is the power of God, then I don't want to miss out on what God is going to do. I don't want to miss out on, a, uh, on an evident and obvious display of God's power. And so a saved person, they're sitting here saying, I, I wouldn't miss it for anything. I, I'm, I'm going to be there. Now, obviously, if I'm, if I'm physically ill, all right, if I'm sick, I, I'm going I'm to stay home. I don't want to infect other people. 
And there are certainly there are certainly times in which people's work schedules might keep them from missing a certain service every so often. I know some of you, some of you men in here, some even some of you ladies, maybe you work every other weekend or something like that, and you're providing for your your, your family and you've got bills to pay and needs to needs to meet. And so I'm not I would never criticize someone for trying to for trying to take care of their take care of their needs. But I'm simply saying, listen, if you're off work and if you're in town and if you're healthy, save people don't have the attitude of, well, should we go tonight or not? No, no, saved people are sitting here saying, no, hold on a minute, the power of God is gonna be on display because God has promised that there is power in preaching, therefore, I'm going to be present. I'm gonna be there. That's how a saved person thinks. So, so look at that and look at it well. Preaching is either foolishness to you or it is life-giving depending on your spiritual condition. So ask yourself the question, tonight, how, how do I view preaching? How do I view preaching? Are you just here tolerating it tonight? Are you here because, well, the kids are here, and again, it looked kind of weird if I dropped the kids off and headed up to Chipotle or Starbucks or you know, went and mowed my lawn you know, while the kids are in church, and you know, I gotta set a good example. You know. uh, what, 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 is, what is your reason for being here tonight? What is, your, what is your attitude towards the preaching of the word of God? Uh, boy, that's a, that's a powerful, powerful thought. Save people prioritize the preaching of God's word. They give it precedence over just about everything else. They do not want to miss out on what the preacher might say, knowing, knowing that he is delivering an eternal message from God's eternal word. To some, to some, preaching is nonsense. To others, preaching is a necessity. So what is it to you? What is it to you? Notice, secondly, Paul writes that preaching is a, prim- a primary means through which God works. Now look, if you would, in verse number 21. He says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now here's what you, here's what you understand. The, the Lord God specializes in taking things the world finds of little value and using those things to accomplish great things. That, that, that's how God works. You, you need to understand that. And for some of you, for some of you, maybe you're, you're making the connection. Well, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Maybe that's why God has chosen me. Because when I think about the world, I, I don't find myself to be someone of great value. I'm just an average, ordinary person. I live on a, in a modest house in Cleveland, Ohio. I, I work a normal job. I, I'm just an average, ordinary person. And yet, and yet, boy, God has put his hand on my life. Uh, God is wanting to use me. God is wanting to, to, to take my life and, and stir others using my life. So, so understand that God specializes in taking things that the world says are really not all that valuable and making them valuable. The world, I, I think to myself, the world found little value in a stuttering shepherd by the name of Moses. But what did God do? God used that stuttering shepherd to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage. In the New Testament, the World, no doubt, no doubt. In fact, the disciples even displayed this attitude. The world found little value in a lad with five loaves and two fish. Remember, remember, what, the, remember what the disciples said? But what are they among so many? The world, world found little, little value in those things. But what did God do? Oh, Jesus took those things that were yielded to him, that were given to him, and Jesus blessed them and break them. And what did he do? He fed more than 5,000 people with them. The world finds little value in an ancient book that you and I hold in our laps. But what does God say about this book? God says this book is alive. That this book pierces anyone who will read it. The world finds little value in a flawed and broken man like me. Like any other preacher who will stand before you in your lifetime. The world finds a little value in a flawed and broken man who stands behind a, a pulpit like this one and expounds a text from the Bible. But here's what God calls it. God calls it the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's what preaching is. And that, listen, that is how God works. That is how God has cho- chosen to work in this world. By using something so simple and so seemingly insignificant from the world and from a fleshly perspective that God has said, no, that is what I am going to use. That's what I'm going to use to accomplish my purpose here in this world. Number three, notice, notice this, that Paul writes that preaching is necessary in every season. Preaching is necessary in every season. Uh, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
2 Timothy chapter number 4, Paul is concluding this book to Timothy. It's the last book he'd ever write. And look what he says here in the final chapter. He says in verse number 1, I charge thee therefore before God that the, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So here's the charge. Here's what it is. He says this, preach the word. Amen. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, there are seasons of life in which a reproof is necessary. To reprove means to convince or to convict. Preaching, listen, preaching will get the job done. If, if a reproof is what is necessary, if someone will stand and faithfully preach God's word, preaching will reprove. There are seasons, there are seasons in life in which a rebuke is necessary. To rebuke is to proclaim something is wrong with authority, with confidence. Can I tell you that preaching can accomplish this too? There are seasons of life in which exhortation is the need of the hour. Exhortation means to comfort, to entreat, or to invite. Can I say that if it's exhortation, preaching is the appropriate vehicle to accomplish that? There will even, listen, there will even be a season, there will even be a time that will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. You know what he says? He says, keep on preaching. Keep on preaching. It doesn't matter what season it is. It doesn't matter if it's summer, if it's fall, if it's winter, if it's spring. It doesn't matter if, if, uh, if, if biblical Christianity is popular, if it's unpopular. It doesn't matter if biblical Christianity is accepted or if it's persecuted. What is the, what is the charge that is given? He, he does not give any other qualifiers. He just simply says, preach the word. To be instant, to be ready, in season, out of season. Listen, if you're struggling in some way tonight, you don't need less preaching, you need more preaching. Regardless of what season you're in. Oh, you may be in a season of depression. You know what you need? You need preaching. You may, you may be in a season of, uh, of great success and great accomplishment. You know what you need? You need more preaching. Uh, you may be in a season in which your marriage is struggling or your marriage is thriving. You know what you need? You need more preaching. You may be in a season in which your children are little. Lord knows you need, <laughs> you need more preaching. You may be in a season in which your children are grown. Now they're raised and they're making decisions on their own. And you know this as well as I do. You need more preaching, not less. Now, preaching is always necessary in every season. The preachers that are identified that God sent their way to get the work to resume are these. They're Haggai and Zechariah. You could, you could read their books and you could do a study on exactly what they said to see what their message was. Obviously, we're going to take a look a little bit more deeply tonight, at least with the time that we have left, at the message that was given from Haggai. We only have time to look at Haggai. I don't have time to look at Zechariah's message. But if you would, take your Bible and go with me to Haggai chapter number one. We see his message to the people of God. The book of Haggai is right after the book of Ze uh, Zephaniah and right before the book of Zechariah. Some of you, you may... You may need to go to your table of contents in the beginning of your Bible to find it. It's not a book that we go to often. It's one of the minor prophets. It's just three, short, actually just two short chapters. Not a very long message. And some of you are saying maybe you should take a page out of Haggai's book. And uh, my, my message only has two points tonight, two main points, but several points underneath of it. But I want you to notice, I want you to consider Haggai's message, and I want us to just take some things from it uh, that will be helpful to us tonight. Number one, I think we learn from this message that Haggai gives. Number one is this. The preacher should not speak until he has a word from the Lord. The preacher should not speak until he has a word from the Lord. Would you look at Haggai 1? And look at verse number 1. In the second year of Darius. So you see it's lining up. Remember he said the work did not resume until the second year of Darius. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto, there are their, their names, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Haggai here to me is, is extremely careful. Is extremely careful to, to, to alert his audience that what he was getting ready to say was a word from the Lord. Uh, he makes it very clear. In fact, we, we, don't, we don't know much about Haggai, but, but, but from what I gather, Haggai doesn't say a whole lot. 
doesn't say a whole lot at all, at least not in the pages of history. His words are not recorded for us until, until he is speaking on behalf of the Lord. I love that scripture test. I believe it's in the book of Psalms. It says, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Haggai opens his mouth wide and God gives a message from the Lord. Uh, what I have to say, you've heard me say this over and over again, even just this past Sunday, what I have to say is of little value. I mean, truly. It is of little value. So long as it's so long as my own personal opinion, my own personal ideas, my comes from my worldview, the way that I see things, what I have to say is of little value. But listen, what he has to say is life transforming and life giving. This work, listen, the work of rebuilding the temple, it would not have resumed if the message that Haggai gave came from Haggai. It would have been sufficient. It would not have done the job. It would not have accomplished, it would not have accomplished what Haggai was hoping that it would accomplish. I could stand here all night long and I could, you know, bloviate about this thing or about that thing, and it more than likely it will not move you to do a single thing. But listen, if I'll stand up and if I'll have the power of God and I'll have a message from God, give me five minutes, give me five minutes speaking the message of God and the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and God can do a great work. The preacher ought not. He ought not to speak until he has a word from the Lord. Notice, secondly, I, I think the preacher, we learned some more things about the preacher. Number two, the preacher should know his audience. Now look what, look what happens in verse number two. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I understand that God is speaking here. And nobody knows his people better than God does. But God uses human instruments. How did Haggai, how did Haggai know what the people were saying? How did he know that the people had developed this mindset of it's not time yet? We're still waiting. We, we haven't gotten peace to move forward in this project yet. It's not time for us to resume the work. Well, Haggai knew that because he dwelt among these people. He had heard them talking. He had, he had perhaps, uh, you know, for the lack of a better term, a proverbial, he had stood around the water cooler with them, and he had heard their conversations, and periodically someone might would glance up at the Temple Mountain and say, don't you suppose maybe we ought to go back up there and we ought to resume the work? And someone would reply very quickly, no, nah, it's not time yet. It's not, the, the time is coming, but it's not yet for us to resume the work. And, and Haggai, listen, Haggai was among the people, was around the people enough to know what his audience was saying, to know what his audience was thinking. They were continuing to delay in rebuilding the temple, saying, it's just not time yet. We're not sure exactly when it's going to be time. We're not even exactly sure what it is that we're waiting for, but we'll know it when it, when it happens. We'll know when the time is right for us to begin rebuilding the temple. <clears throat> Can I say the preacher should have the pulse of his people. He should be present enough to have a general idea of how they are living and what they are thinking. This knowledge, listen, this knowledge will enable him, listen, will enable him to preach and teach in a relevant and impactful way. Because as the preacher, as he talks to people and as he moves up and down the aisles, you know, I, I know there's pastors in which, you know, they hide out in their office until just before the service starts and then they run up on the platform, they preach and then they duck out the back door and, and, uh, and then the rest of the week they're traveling and they're preaching in other places and, and uh, listen, I, I'm, I'm, you know, they can do whatever they want to do. But I'm just simply saying as, as a pastor, I feel like I need to be here. I, I, need to, I need to be around you. I need to uh, be fellowshipping with you and communicating with you. <clears throat> and I need to be open so that you can come and communicate with me. And, and all of these things help me in my preaching because it enables me to know my audience. Number three, <clears throat> we find in our text, the preacher, number three, should be bold. The preacher should be bold. Look in verse number three. The Bible says there, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. In 2001, the United States of America fell under attack. You, <clears throat> most of you remember it well. It was a dreadful day in our nation's history. And um, I, I, if I remember correctly, uh, a preacher that most of us would know his name, Jerry Falwell, 
And Jerry Falwell, shortly after that happened, he, either on national television, an interview or something, he, 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 laid, he laid the blame for what happened there on our nation moving away from God. And he said, I, I believe in some respects this is maybe a form of judgment uh, in which God is pouring out some of his wrath on the way that we're living and the way that, you know, that we have turned our back on the Lord. And I have to tell you, you cannot, you cannot believe the outcry that he received. How dare, how dare you say something like this? How dare you? Now, now listen, I understand Haggai is, 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 is speaking a prophetic message straight from the mouth of God to the ears of the people. And I, I am aware that Jerry Falwell uh, was not necessarily speaking in that way. But I'm just simply saying, you get the idea, this type of message is not a popular message. In other words, when we, when we connect, when we connect our present circumstances and the difficulty of our present circumstances with, with our, our disobedient living as a culture and as a nation, people, listen, people resist that in a big time way. People want no part of that. Don't, don't tell me that. It's not my fault that we're in the mess that we're in. I, I have nothing to do with this. Now listen, I'm, I'm, not here to, I'm not here to say one, one thing or another, but I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that when you preach a message like this, it's not typically well received. And Haggai stands up, and Haggai says, you know, you, uh, you need to consider your ways. Because while you, sleep, while you sleep in beautiful homes tonight, with a roof over your head, and with you know, rooms and walls and doors and windows, and, and, uh, and, and you have all of these comforts and all of these conveniences. You know the house of God, the, 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 the very building that you were brought back here to rebuild? Do you know that that house lies waste? While you sit around and while you enjoy all the comforts and the conveniences and the pleasures of life, the house of God lies waste. And let me just tell you, 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 you think it's not that big of a deal, but let me just tell you, 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 uh, you here, here's, here's how it's affecting you. And he tells him in verse number six, he says, you so much when you work all day, you exhaust yourself in the fields. And he says, yet at harvest time, you bring in little. He, he, says, he says, you eat plenty. You put plenty of food in your belly, and yet you never have enough. You're always still hungry. He, he says, you, you, you drink a lot of beverages, but you, you don't have what you need. He says, you clothe yourself, but you're always cold. You're never warm. And he says, you take the things that you earn, and you put it into a bag for safekeeping, and yet that bag has holes in it, and you're losing some of what you're putting in there. And he says, here's why all of those things are happening, because you have refused. You have refused to do what God has called you to do. Now you tell me if that, if that got Haggai you know, on the most popular preacher list. Now you tell me whether there were lots of people wanting to get close to him and spend time around him. No, that, that wasn't probably the, the case. That probably there was some bristling as he's delivering this message. But listen, listen, if a preacher's gonna be effective, he must be bold. He must tell you the truth and he must tell it in an authoritative and a convincing way. On two occasions, he urges his audience to consider their ways. Notice number four, the preacher, finally tonight, the preacher should be clear. Look in verse number eight. He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Not only, listen, not only must the bold, preacher be bold, and confront things. But listen, he must also be clear as to what the next steps should be. Now, folks should not leave the church confused. They should never leave the church confused. Now, they may not always make the decision that God would have them make, but they should never walk out of here wondering what exactly that decision God would have them make is. They should always walk out of here saying, I know what God wants me to do. And maybe God wants you to be more faithful. It may be that God wants you to take another step in your service to the Lord through the local church. It may be that God wants you to give more. It may be that God wants you to serve more. It may be that God wants you to teach. It may be that God wants you to do this or God wants you to do that. But, but, but listen, you ought never to leave here saying, I'm not sure what God wants me to do. The, the, the message should be so clear as to know exactly, exactly what it is that we ought to be doing. I, I think to myself, listen, it's not enough to show people where they are wrong. The preacher must give them a path for getting right. That is essential. It's not enough for me just to say, well, this is, this is wrong. This is, this is a problem. Don't do this anymore. 
But there needs to be, there needs to be, from the preaching of God's word, there needs to be a path to get right. And Haggai confronts them. He says, you're, he says, you're struggling, and, you, and, he, and here's why you're struggling. Because you've allowed the temple to lie waste. You've rebuilt your homes. You've rebuilt your, your communities. You've rebuilt your streets and your roads. You've done all of these things while the temple lies waste. And as a result, you're lacking the blessing of God, and you're wondering, why are we struggling so much? And here is why we're struggling. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He looks at him and says, now here's what you need to do. Climb that mountain. Climb that mountain, cut down some more trees, and go back to that, go back to that mount and start building the temple again. And if you'll do it, if you'll do it, God will be pleased. And I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't know what it is in your life that needs to be resumed. I don't know that what it is in your life that needs to get going again. It could be like an old car in which you haven't started in a while and you put the key in and you turn it and it cranks just barely. And maybe, maybe, maybe God's gonna use some preaching. What a privilege it would be for God to use me in this way in your life to, to sort of take the jumper cables and put them on the battery of your spirit and to, through the preaching of the word of God that God would reignite you and give energy to your spiritual life again so that you could resume the work. I don't know exactly what it is that you have stopped doing or, or where you have left off in and, and, and an area of your life that lies waste, but I'm here to tell you, listen, God would have you to get back to the work. He'd have you get back to the work. And one of the ways, one of the ways in which he uses in order to stir us up again in this familiar pattern is he uses powerful preaching. Lord willing, next Wednesday night, we'll look at some other things that God uses in this familiar pattern. And we'll consider how God is at work in the hearts and lives of people.